All right. In this particular textbook, um, they actually refer to Beethoven as a romantic composer, not like romantic love romantic, but the next time period after the classical period is called the romantic period. Um, and some people put him there. I don't because of the year that he was born and when he died. But a lot of people think that the style of his music actually matches the next time period a little bit better. Um, whatever. Um, I will dig in. Here we go. Of all the great composers, Beethoven was probably the most inclined to brood. He had plenty to brood about. He was moody, bad-tempered, arrogant, and often insulting. But he could also be warm, affectionate, and good-humored. You just had to catch him on the right day. Ludwig von Beethoven was born on December 16, 1770 in Bonn in a little house on Bongasse. His family soon moved to a bigger house on Rheingasse, not far away. Beethoven's grandfather had been Kapellmeister, so that's like the, the chapel musician, to the elector of Bonn and also a prosperous wine merchant. His father was merely a mediocre musician, and I'm sorry to say, a drunk. Beethoven's father very much wanted the boy to become a musical prodigy, just like Mozart. Little Beethoven started the piano lessons when he was very young, in fact, so small that he had to stand on the piano bench to reach the keys. His father also told everyone he was two years younger just to make him seem more talented. Beethoven was a grubby little boy, the type who always forgets to wash behind his ears. He quit school at 11 and by 16 was court organist to the elector. He was already beginning to compose small pieces and was an absolute whiz at sight reading, which is a hard thing to do. In 1792, he moved to Vienna, where for a short while he took lessons from Haydn, Albrechtsberger, and Salieri. You know, we talked about Haydn already, and I don't know who this Albrechtsberger is. Sounds like a sandwich. But Salieri was the one who people blamed for poisoning Mozart because he was jealous. And they thought maybe Salieri was going to steal um, the music that he was writing and claim credit for it himself. Nobody actually really knows. He was too pig-headed to learn much from any of them. Johann Schenk corrected Beethoven's exercises before he submitted them to Haydn, which saved him some embarrassment. Beethoven was quite a hit in Viennese society as a concert pianist, even though he didn't have the proper sort of manners. The aristocracy expected him to be subservient and to know his place. Beethoven knew his place. It just wasn't the same place they expected of him. He once told off his patron, Prince Lichnowsky, with the remark, There are and there will be thousands of princes. There is only one Beethoven. Must be a pretty famous remark since we heard it in the last reading, too. He could be very stubborn if he wanted to be, which was most of the time. If he didn't feel like it, he wouldn't play when you asked him, even if, like the Countess Thun, you got down on your knees and begged him. He was too busy thinking about sublime music to worry with himself with societal niceties. Once, when violinist Ignaz Schupenach, I cannot even start to say that word. What is that? Skapanzig. That's as close as I'm coming. When he complained about a particularly difficult passage in one of Beethoven's string quartets, the composer shouted at him, I can't think about your miserable violin when I am speaking to my god. He had a raucous laugh and was inclined to spit whenever he felt the urge. I don't know if I would love it if history remembered me as being a person inclined to spit. Anyway, as you might expect with such a hot temper, Beethoven had real trouble keeping servants. They just wouldn't put up with him. He didn't get along very well with landlords either, so he had to move every few months. He was a slob, basically. The Baron de Tremont, swears that on one visit there was a full chamber pot under Beethoven's piano. Have you figured out yet what a chamber pot is? Maybe Google it or maybe don't. When Beethoven came visiting it was a good idea to hide away the fine porcelain. He dropped things. Beethoven was no better in restaurants. He would leave without paying the bill or sometimes absent-mindedly pay for a meal he hadn't ordered. He scribbled music on the napkins, the tablecloths, the menus. Once he got so angry at a waiter that he dumped his plate of veal and gravy over the man's head. He was fond of fish, but his favorite dishes were scrambled eggs in a bread soup or a heaping bowl of macaroni and Parmesan cheese. 
I don't have an issue with that. I think I'd eat that just about every day if it was offered to me, right? You guys like that? He liked his coffee strong, always 60 beans to the cup. But we mustn't lose sight of what makes Beethoven important. He may have been a boor and a slob, but he was a great composer. He wrote nine symphonies, five piano concertos, 16 string quartets, 10 sonatas for violin and five for cello, 30 piano sonatas, two masses, more chamber, choir, chamber music than I can name, and a duet for obligato eyeglasses. I have no idea what that's about. He wrote one opera, Fidelio, and four overtures to start it off. The first three were trial runs and are now called the Leonor, Leonor overtures, just to avoid confusion. We know he was a great composer because his brain was so big. And, as Wagner pointed out, because it was encased in such a thick skull. It's a little backhanded insult there. Beethoven never married, although he liked to flirt, and his friend Wegler tells us that he was always in love with someone. Perhaps, unlike Bach, Grieg, or Stravinsky, he had no eligible cousins to marry. Ugh. He proposed to Magdalene Wellman, a singer in the Vienna Court Opera, but she refused him because he was so ugly and half craft. It's probably just as well. Beethoven had syphilis. Ooh, that's bad, and if you don't know what that is, don't look that up either. He was hardly the tall, dark, and handsome type. Well, he was dark anyway. He had good teeth, piercing eyes, and a stern, pockmarked face. He was only five foot, four inches tall. Guess who else was five feet, four inches tall? Mozart. After his brother Caspar died, Beethoven fought a long court battle with his sister-in-law, Johanna, for custody of her son, Carl, Beethoven's nephew. Beethoven might have meant well for the boy, but he certainly had some nasty things to say about Johanna, whom he thought an unfit mother. The years of the court battle took their toll on Beethoven, and it was all he could do to compose two cello concertos, three piano sonatas, um, including the Hammerklavier sonata, and the song cycle An die Ferne Geliebte. Hardly worth mentioning, really. The biggest tragedy of Beethoven's life, of course, was his increasing deafness. He began to notice it when he was about 30, and before he was 50, he had lost his hearing entirely. As the years wore on, he broke more and more strings on his piano, pounding the keys, trying to hear the sounds. In the end, he fell apart completely and died in 1827. Anselm Hüttenbrenner, who was at his bedside, tells us that in his final moments, Beethoven roused himself from his coma to shake an angry fist at the heavens. There was a dramatic clap of thunder and a flash of lightning, and the great composer was dead. At Beethoven's funeral, a crowd of 20,000 lined the streets to pay their last respects. Schubert and Hummel were among the pallbearers. Music history tends to romanticize Beethoven, seeing him as the mighty genius struggling against tragic deafness. I prefer to think of him in those moments where he took time out from his glorious composing of music to insult an aristocrat or dump dinner over a waiter's head. Okay, one more reading after this, um, and you will have some sheets to work on. So, 